you know, if, if you notice that you could be part of like maybe connecting two stretches to, you know, connecting two blocks that could have a high, very high marginal benefit because your, your particular plot would kind of like tip, tip you over the threshold and sort of um, produce a huge, a, an extra, an extra amount of benefits that would be kind of a big like jump, a big jump in benefits. Well, maybe we could have, um, cause I think in real life you would be able to like sort of communicate with the people around you. So if there was a degree of like um, being, knowing who was next to you, whatever, being like, oh, do you, do you want to try to come together to, to make this happen? Um, could make the game work a little smoother. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there, there's certainly communication would provide some kind of, some kind of, grease some grease to the system it would oil the system and it allow for for mutually beneficial exchanges you might you might think of this as even like but yeah, potential for maybe some cosian bargains to happen where if somebody um somebody has a high land quality and so they have a very high opportunity cost but maybe they're in a critical part of the map where if they preserve and and uh, they they'll fit into a, a a conservation block that has a very high value. You might think about like the people that are part of that conservation block, or or even like the general population, might be able to 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 provide maybe some additional like side payments on top of the of the government payments in order to sort of tip the scales into that um, a situation where you get very high benefits because you're able to coordinate. Yeah, so it's kind of what I have what I have in my head right now is like you know you hire. You hire some some conservation biologists and ecologists to understand what the link is between land conservation and ecosystem services. You know, if you could draw upon existing research or do some original studies to get some idea of like what this link is between the, the conservation decisions themselves and the ecosystem service level that's provided. And then, um, you know, you might you might hire some economists to figure out kind of what what this is valued at, turn this into some kind of value. And it's, it's, not a, it's not necessarily a linear relationship because we have these spatial, spatial aspects that matter a lot where, you know, if, if you have a block here and a block here and a block here, and let's say these two are conserved on the outside, then, you know, the value, it turns out the value here is, uh, you know, the value for this, this plot itself is, is dependent on on what's going on around it. So that's that makes it a, a more complicated problem. But in theory, you could you could again do some research, hire some some conservation biologists, hire some economists to to try to get an estimate of maybe how this function would look, how the how the payoffs, ecosystem service payoffs would would look under different arrangements of conservation. That could give you a sense of the benefits, but you still wouldn't know what the what the opportunity costs are which is the other part of the equation that matters because you don't, you'd have to know exactly what the capacities and the, um, the skills and the, the farming ability and the, um, the land fertility that's present in each person's, each farmer's plots of land, which is, um, you know, that's just a massive information problem. You don't, you don't, you're not able to necessarily gather that information the same way that, uh, that you would be able to kind of map out the, the the relationship between conservation and ecosystem services and value, and so the um, the, the the conservation payments and the uh, the auction is actually maybe some way to get the, the the farmers to kind of reveal what their private costs are. So let me I want to just draw I want to draw a um, a parallel between these different mechanisms. We had the the auction mechanism, which had a commitment to to accept a certain number of bids. In this case, the commitment was to 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 set the land conservation at fifty percent. We basically set you set the quantity you set the quantity of land conservation that you want, and you take bids from farmers, and you you commit in advance to to, to accepting the lowest fifty percent of the bids. What that's doing is is it's actually implicitly guaranteeing a certain amount of land conservation and trying to achieve that level of conservation at least cost. It's trying to understand that, that farmers, they're going to want to try to bid a little bit lower in order to sort of outcompete other bids. And you tend, under that scenario, it, it depends on the degree of, of communication and whether there's potential for collusion or not. But in that situation, you would tend to have, you know, the lowest cost 
the lowest opportunity cost plots submitting the lowest bids. You, you tend to have the, the people with the lowest land quality submitting their bids at the lowest level, people with higher land quality submitting higher bids. That's one mechanism that the government can use to filter out um, or, or to get some information about what people's land quality is. You'd expect, again, you'd expect the lowest quality land to maybe submit lower bids, the highest quality land to submit higher bids, and you'd skim off the, the, the lowest 50%, pay those, pay those people their bids, and conserve a fixed amount at that cost, at whatever cost is required to, to pay those, those bids. This has a parallel to the, the Martin Weitzman prices versus quantities idea that we had talked about before, where the auction, in a sense, is is like the quantity policy or the or the tradable permits policy, where you set the quantity, and you 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 meet that you meet that quantity at least cost, but you don't know exactly what the marginal cost of, of conservation is going to be. Kind of like in the pollution example, you you set the quantity of permits, but you don't know exactly how what the marginal cost of of that of that abatement is going to be. So this auction this auction structure, you can broadly think of this as being kind of like a parallel policy in land conservation to the, the quantity policy in some of the air pollution that we had looked at, or the more general just pollution context that we had looked at. In contrast, the, 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 the $2,000 conservation payment, uh, you know, there was, there was some, there was some opportunities in, in rounds two, three, four, and five for bonus payments. But in general, um, if we just think about that as being a flat, a flat conservation payment. This is equivalent to the government setting a price on conservation, letting farmers respond in whatever way they want, allowing any any farmer that wants to opt in is allowed to. Whereas that's a little bit different than the previous one. This in this case, any any farmer can opt in. Whereas before, under the auction policy, there's only there's only some farmers that are able to opt in. Only the lowest fifty percent of the bids are able to opt in. And and get the get the payment and and get paid to do the conservation. Um, so it lim- auction the auction limits the the quantity of conservation, but it but it it limits it but it sets it at some fixed level, whereas the the conservation payment sets the price of conservation, and lets far let, lets any farmer who wants to respond by being able to opt in, and take a conservation payment in exchange for conserving their land. So in this case, the the conservation price is set, but the conservation amount, ultimately how much is conserved, is uncertain, just like it was under the, under the tax policy in a pollution case that we had looked at in prices versus quantities, where the conservation amount is unknown, but the price is fixed. So I just wanted to point that out, that this, this, these policies uh, have some parallel with the pollution policy um, analysis that we had done before in chapter eight. Uh, specifically the the analysis under uncertainty where where these these conservation payments those are similar more similar to a a pollution price that that would be that would have the characteristics of of the tax that we had looked at before whereas the auction has the 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 characteristics of a uh, a quantity policy or a tradable permits policy which sets the quantity and the marginal cost of pollution ends up being being uncertain at the end of the day because you don't know exactly you don't know exactly what the bids are going to be. You know you're going to accept the lowest 50%, but you don't know what what sort of cost range those are going to fall into. You don't and specifically you don't know if you don't know if the lowest 50% is going to include extremely high co- opportunity cost land or whether it's going to be a lot of a lot of cheap land. You don't know for example the plots that are between the, the 40 and 50% of the bids, you don't know whether those are going to be extremely costly to conserve or whether those are going to be um, very cheap to conserve. So are there any questions about, about that, about that framing, about the way that I just framed it as being similar to the, to the, um, the prices versus quantities kind of pollution policy scenario? And then the, the last thing that I'll say about this is that these are, both the auction and the conservation payment, or I should say the auction and then the straight $2,000 conservation payments are examples of, of uh, cost-effective cost effective policies. 
in both cases, you are expecting that that it's going to be the lowest oppor opportunity cost land, which is conserved. In the case of the auction, it's going to be the lowest 50% of the of the opportunity cost land, or the lowest the lowest 50% of the land quality for agriculture is going to be conserved. In the uh, conservation payment, you know that anybody that has profitability at $2,000 or below is likely to opt in. And so you're able to sort of isolate the lowest cost land and, and ensure that the lowest cost, the lowest opportunity cost land is conserved. But there's nothing on the benefits side uh, that, that you know about. There, until you start, the reason that you might offer some bonuses for, for conserving land that's, that's adjacent to someone else or conserving land that's part of a corridor, the reason you might offer those bonuses is in order to take into account the, um, the conservation benefits, which typically would not be taken into account because cost effectiveness, cost effectiveness just tries to achieve some, some level of abatement, some level of, of conservation or some level of pollution cleanup at least cost. It tries to hit that target at least cost uh, and it is not flexible to maybe changing changing the amount based on the benefits that are possible. So the flat the flat payment and the auction scenario, those are straight cost effectiveness measures or you know, measures that you'd expect to be just concerned about cost effectiveness. And then uh, the bonus payments, the bonus payments that you might offer, those take benefits into account as well, which is more of um, that's more of an efficiency idea. That's more of like trying to not just keep costs low, but also consider, is there a way to maybe spend a little bit more and get, uh, get more for your money in a way, not just trying to spend a fixed amount of money in the best way possible, but maybe if there's an opportunity to spend a little bit more money and get huge benefits from that, taking advantage of that. And that's, that's, what, these, that's what these bonus payments strive to do is offer a little bit of an extra incentive to enhance the benefits of conservation um, or enhance the quantity of conservation if if that conservation is extremely ecologically valuable. It's, it's to give it a little bit of an additional incentive to get people that are on the fence with ecologically sensitive land to make, to make uh, conservation decisions. So um, the next thing I want to do is, is get into um, some fisheries economics. I have um, a graph here, which I'm, I'm hoping will, will be helpful for thinking about how this, uh, thinking about some of the population dynamics. Uh, we're going we're gonna to think about the population biology of, of fisheries. And we have time on the, on the x-axis here. Total population is on the, the y-axis. I have this divided up into um, different horizontal layers. You can sort of broadly think of this as these different zones. I have the red zone at the bottom, the green zone in the middle, and the, the orange zone at the top. Again, these zones are, are, are divided up according to the total population of the, of the stock. Let's consider the bottom layer first. We have a critical threshold, which I'm going to call X min, which is the critical threshold of fish below which there is kind of a, a death spiral that occurs where the fish, the fish stock starts to shrink down to extinction. And the reason that is is, be, is because at, at low stocks, there's plenty of food, but the, um, when the stock gets, gets critically low, it's harder for, for fish to find mates. It's harder for male and female fish to mate with one another. They, there's, there's more distance between them and, they, and they, they, don't, they don't find each other as easily. And so breeding opportunities decrease, which leads to lower fish populations the, the following year, which if there were problems before, there's definitely going to be, going to be problems if the, if the fish population shrinks below what it was before. That's going to lead to fewer breeding opportunities. And you're going to get this kind of gradual decline in population down to, um, down to zero eventually. So that's kind of what happens at that, at that lowest level of the, um, of, the, of the graph. That's the bottom layer. That's the red zone. That's the danger zone. And this is, you know, from a mathematical perspective, we call this we call this an unstable equilibrium. That's an unstable equilibrium. Uh, as I mentioned, if the stock drops below that, that level of X min, we get kind of a, a gradual decline, which leads to a smaller population, which leads to a, a, a more decline, which leads to less population, which leads to eventually ex extinction. That's what happens if, if you get kind of a, a drop below that X min threshold. 
that's one that's one sense in which unsta it's unstable but it's also unstable because if you get a slight uh like a slight jump above x min if you get a slight jump above x min to something a, a little bit higher than x min you end up with the fish have more breeding opportunities which lead to more fish next year which lead to more breeding opportunities which lead to more fish next year and that process will continue eventually um, that's going to lead to some kind of something that looks a little bit like exponential growth in the beginning uh, eventually there's there's competition for food which starts to put a little bit of a damper on population and you, you sort of stop you, you don't get as you don't get the um the exponential growth forever what you end up getting is some kind of tapering off some leveling off as competition for food gets a little bit more fierce and you end up with something that's going to approach x max it's going to it's going to sort of approach a maximal population level based on um you don't have any problems regenerating more fish there's plenty of of opportunities for the fish to breed but the limiting factor at that point is food so the reason they don't they don't continue growing exponentially is because food fish food starts to be relatively scarce at high populations you can think of it like the the fish food per capita starts to decline and that and that causes causes difficulty surviving from the fish the breeding the breeding opportunities are not the limiting factor but the food becomes a limiting factor and this is um, because we have something that that's sort of approaching this this x max level from below we call this a, uh, a stable equilibrium the reason it's stable it doesn't have to do specifically with with the fact that this unstable equilibrium has an extinction possibility specifically this is more a stable equilibrium in a mathematical sense where if there's some kind of uh, jump either above or below let's say there's you know let's say you're at x max and for some reason there's some there's some temporary uh, disease which breaks out which just reduces the population for one season and then the disease goes away and the fish are able to just proceed their their activities as normal after that maybe they have like a thinking about this on the on the time axis maybe there's like a one season there's a jump uh, a jump below you know this is maybe a one a one year interval there's a, a, a drop in the in the population because of some disease a temporary disease which doesn't persist but just has some temporary effect on the population this is going to eventually by the next year assuming the disease is not present anymore this is going to revert back to the x max level and that's the sense in which it's a uh, a stable equilibrium you might think of a, in the opposite case there might be a some kind of food that the fish eats temporarily becomes more abundant for a short period of time and so you the food stops being a limiting factor for a short time you get some some growth uh, you get kind of a something that affects the population in a positive way but if that's just a temporary food source that doesn't persist it just kind of enters the environment for a short period and then and then goes away that's going to increase population but then once it's once that extra food source is 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 taken away you get the the force the natural forces of competition for food which set in again which lead to a, a decline in population and eventually sort of a reversion a reversion to this to this x max level so that's the sense in which this is a is a uh, stable equilibrium is that you get reversion to you get reversion to x max in in the event that there's any kind of jump away from x max or any kind of shock which causes the population to fall either above or below x max you get a, you get some kind of reversion to to x max whereas the opposite is true in the unstable equilibrium case in that case you just get any kind of shock that occurs is going to lead to um, something which is going to take you further and further away from x min it's in, if it's if there's a, a negative shock it's going to lead to something that that leads you down to extinction and if it's a positive shock it's going to lead you on an upward tra trajectory toward toward x max so in, in, in either case that it's an unstable it's an unstable equilibrium so that's the that's some of the fundamental population biology which persists in in the study of fisheries and and therefore has has implications for the economics of, of fisheries one way we can we can look at this next is we can look at 
rather than looking at the total population over time, we can, we can change the variables a little bit and, and put the total population on the x-axis. So this, this x-axis is now the stock of fish or the total population of fish. And we can think about what the growth rate is. We can think about what the population growth rate is. So th this y-axis is now, is now growth rate. So, so anything above the, the, uh, this, this horizontal line at zero, anything above that, that line at zero is increasing population. That's, that's, that's an increase from one year to the next in the fish population. Anything below that, that, that horizontal line at zero is going to represent negative growth. So we can represent the same, the same concepts. We can actually represent, as what was on the previous slide, we can represent those same ideas on this slide with, with a little bit of a change of variable. So one way we might do that is we might consider, now this is the, um, you know, this is the red zone. This is still the red zone, except the red zone is now kind of a vertical line rather than a horizontal line. And in this case, the red zone, you know, I think of the red zone as being this, this uh, horizontal distance here where there's negative growth. We might think of the green zone. This is the green zone is the, um, the horizontal distance here where there's, there's positive growth. And then the yellow zone is the horizontal distance here where there's uh, negative growth again. So if, you, if, we're, if we're at some level, if we're at X min, that means there's exactly, there's exactly the amount of fish that's going to uh, maintain itself from one year to the next. The, the, uh, the limitations in breeding opportunities are exactly offset by the abundance of food that persists at X min. But as soon as there's any kind of shock to the population where the, um, where the, the population drops below X min, we start to get a, a negative growth rate. So the growth rate is gonna be negative. The growth rate is gonna be negative for any level of population below X min. So at, at a level that's a little bit below X min, you'll get, you'll get a, a negative growth rate, you'll get a shrinkage of population. That's gonna to lead to an even smaller population the next year, which will lead to even more negative growth in population. That negative growth in population will lead to smaller population the next year, which will lead to more negative growth and so on. You get this kind of, uh, this dynamic process where there's a gradual sort of movement over time from X min to zero. If there's some kind of shock to the population, which causes it to, to drop below X min. So that's the extinction path that we saw before. And again, anything below the, the horizontal line is uh, negative growth. Anything above the horizontal line is positive growth. So if we get some kind of shock that represents a, um, an, an opportunity to, to grow the population above, above X min. That represents um, an area where you're going to have a positive growth rate after that. So you might have like, um, if some, some, something that shocks the population a little bit higher, you get a, a, positive, a positive growth rate. That's going to result in, in a little bit higher population because there's a positive growth rate. So we have more growth the next year which increases the population. Eventually you're gonna get some, some kind of, uh, some slow, s some slowdown on this process as food gets more scarce, but you still have positive, still have positive growth as you move to the right on this, uh, on this population axis. So the, the curve is gonna look a little bit different than the other one, but it's gonna have some similar, like the same information is kind of present in these curves where the tendency in this case is growth, and then the growth kind of reaches a peak and then growth is still positive, but the growth rate itself starts to slow down. You get, you get slower growth. You still get an increasing population anywhere in that green zone. You still get an increase in population anywhere in the green zone, but, but the growth rate itself kind of slows down and reaches, uh, reaches a peak and then, then reaches zero again. So the growth rate again reaches zero at X max. And then anything, any, anything where the, the, the fish stock is Above X max, you're going to get a negative growth rate because that's where that's where food food scarcity starts to be the overwhelming factor, and the fish can't the fish the, the food stock isn't enough to sustain a population of fish at that size, so you get a shrinkage in population, um, and you get this this dynamic uh, tendency towards back towards X max, 
if you have a, a stock that's above X max. So this is this is the um, this is the the what the graph looks like if you plot growth rate on the Y axis and population stock on the um, on the X axis. Now uh, consider what this means here for for the economics. If we have the fish stock at say this level right here, if if we if we maintain a stock at this level, we have a growth rate which is at this at this peak, which means that we have the the fish are regenerating. Uh, the or I'll say it this way: the additional fish we get each year is a maximum at at this at this uh, at this stock X in the middle here. I'm gonna I'm gonna call this MS X MSY because this fish stock represents the uh, the maximum maximum sustainable yield. So the the fact that the fact that this 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 uh, hoard, this this y axis represents the growth rate implies that that the 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 position on the y axis or the position on the y axis here represents the additional fish you get every year so this would be like it's a sustainable yield because it's it's the extra harvest that's possible every single year because the fish is the fish are reproducing at, at this at this particular rate the fish reproduce at that rate that means you're able to to skim off you're sort of able to harvest a certain amount of the fish. You, you might think of this like you're at XMS, you're at this XMSY level. You harvest the fish a little bit, but then they reproduce at this at this uh, at this max growth rate, and so you have exactly the same number of fish the next year because what you have harvested gets restored in the um, in the regeneration of the, of the next population or the replenishment, and that would be the the maximum sustainable yield. That's one. That's one possible candidate for um, for something that we would want to maybe choose as our level of harvesting, in order to 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 fish at a sustainable rate. That doesn't completely bring in all the economic factors, though. And we'll talk about uh, next time. We'll we'll talk about some of the economic factors. We've already touched on some of them in.